You okay to drive, Athena? I'm not driving anywhere today, thank goodness. Oh, you're home. Good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. So we're it looks we're just like town hall. Yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> The beauty of Zoom. Yeah. We're open to Are attendees. Jump, We're recording. <clears throat> We're recording. And Mandy, I'm going to make you host before I jump out. Excellent. Thank Thanks. you for opening this, Athena. Please take care. Yeah, feel better. So, okay. Thanks, everybody. You're yeah. welcome. Take care. Okay. There we go. Um, we have a whopping large number of people here today. I know if something's wrong. Whoa. I don't think I've held a CRC meeting with no one in attendance in ages, Pat. Um, I can't remember one. I really um, <laughs> GOL is typical like this, but not CRC. Yeah. So um, here we go. We'll, we'll get started. Um, Seeing the presence of a quorum, I am calling this April 20th, 2023 special meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at 4.32 p.m. Um, ah, making my own notes here. Um, Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, and extended by chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by a technological means. I'm also going to note that this meeting is being recorded. So with that, we're going to take attendance um, and do a roll call just to make sure that uh, members can be heard and we can hear every member. Um, with that, Shalini. I'm present. And Mandy is present. Pat. Present. Jennifer. Present. Oh, I had and no Cameron. idea Shalini was here. <laughs> she came in while I was doing a speech. Hi. <laughs> um, like and, disembodied voice okay and pam rooney will be absent today although we will check um and if she does happen to show up we'll make note of that but i do not expect her today um with that um we are going to move on on our agenda there are no public hearings today um i'll make the announcement we were supposed to have a public hearing on april 13th um on a zoning proposal that um, meeting was not posted properly by accident. And so that public hearing was continued um, due to the lack of being able to hold a meeting to the next regular council meeting, which will regular CRC meeting, which will be next week, the 27th of April at, and the hearing will begin at 4.35 PM. But today there are no public hearings. We have a number of action items on our agenda. Um, and we're going to try and take them in order. Um, and the order that I've put them in is um, in the, we're going to do a lot of residential rental bylaw. And if there's time after we get through all of that, we'll talk about the nuisance house bylaw. Um, but we're going to start with the engagement report under the residential rental bylaw, then move to the bylaw, then to the fee structure and schedule, and then the regulations. And if we have time after that, we'll move to the nuisance house bylaw, although I'm not sure we will. <laughs> but I put it on there in case we're very efficient. Um, and after the action items, we have no discussion items. We'll move to public comment and then the minutes and then any announcements. So um, with that, unless there are questions, we'll dive right into the engagement report. Um, we are, give me a second. So we are, and I apologize, you've seen this before. I put the wrong, well, I did not put this full report in today's packet. It has been, it's the same thing that has been in the packet for a couple of weeks. So it is not new. I will make sure it gets into this packet. I just, for some reason, I put the wrong document in, although the document that is in um, is some comments Pam Rooney had. And since she's not here, it's actually good that it's in the packet because um, everyone can see what she wanted to do with it. Um, and so um, this is it. I think we were, there should be a note as to where we were um, as we page down. I think we had 
we're working our way through, Shalini, if I'm right, we were working our way through and we're sort of in the quantitative analysis way down. Is no, I think we had finished all the analysis and oh. we were starting with the executive summary. So that was under key issues and considerations. The key factors. Yeah. Okay. Was there a note? Jennifer has a hand up though. Yeah. Jennifer. Um, yeah, so I just, I did have a comment on page 33. Should we just save that till after we finish the executive summary? Oh, no, let's go down to that one. So it's just, uh, there are two questions. I think it's the page above it. Hmm. Oh, there. Yeah, so at the top, it says there's a question one and a question two. And These question two, two actually written it down. Yeah, that one. And I just wanted to ask if that could be taken out because again, it wasn't really, it's a little, it's extraneous to the responses. Um, and I think it's just covered in zoning. Does anyone have a problem with removing it? No. So I think with this one, without a two, just for formatting purposes, we'll get rid of the number one. It'll so look, just a bullet? It was, it was, well, it'll look. It just look like part, another sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Is what it'll look okay, like. Okay, that was it. Okay, so let's page back up to the executive summary. Um, and I think we had started, as Shalini said, with the key issues and considerations, and we had made it through one, two, three. Wait, did we make it through all of that? Again? Yeah, I think we did. We made it at least through three. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I think we were on either four or five. No, I think we definitely didn't do four. I don't remember. Yeah. So are there any well, questions? I'm oh, sorry. Jennifer. Yeah, no, I was just saying, I guess Pam's, um, what's in the packet, what, I think, is that where we left That's off? Fine. That's number, yeah, we haven't come to the occupancy. Oh, okay, okay. I'm totally okay, by the way, with those changes. So we'll get to that. That's, I think, number five. That's under number five. Okay. Yeah, that's, I think, under mm -hmm. occupancy. I think it has a number one in her document, but I think it's, yeah, it's the next one, number five. So we hadn't gotten there yet. Is there any way to make that bigger? Better? Huh, let me see if I can do it on my screen. Are you talking about my share? Yeah. So I've I've shared the whole screen. Right. And now it's taking up most of the screen too. I've made it bigger on my yeah, no, screen. I get that's probably okay. okay. <laughs> So any requested changes on number four, the strong neighborhoods and recommendations? Uh, should recommendations be considerations? Yeah, it's considerations. And considerations. Yeah, it's just to be consistent everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Can you move down a little? Mm. I was just going to say that I thought it was interesting that on the graphs on page 15 that residents and tenants like expressed a desire to get to know each other. So that was like, you know, that was a quantitative question asked, like how important is that? And both tenants and residents 
round year, full year residents kind of rated that as an important aspect. I don't know how that can happen where, you know, some people talked about the Brownie week and neighbors welcoming new tenants or, but it seemed like, you know, it, the, the neighborhoods would really benefit from more um, opportunities for connection between the neighbors and, and also tenants feeling like they don't feel like a sense of belonging or they feel they're less than if they don't own a house in Amherst. So just those kind of things, I think it's just nice for everyone, important for everyone to hear that how can we make it more inclusive, um, inclusive environment for everyone. And I think for tenants, it's important to hear about residents and their children and their schedules and just that culture of empathy where we're, you know, building strong communities together. Um, you know, in, in the neighborhood I live in, they've been having, it's really the whole precinct has, but they have a first Sunday of every month brunch. It's been for more than 25 years and the students do come who live in the neighborhood, not all, but I mean, some, and I don't, I mean, it's been really great. I would recommend that. <laughs> Is, does it rotate around or is it in one? Yes, day? it goes. There's even dishes. So we don't use paper dishes. There's uh -huh. a basket. I mean, it was going on long before we moved here. It's been going on for almost three decades. And yes, there's somebody that maintains a whole year long list of who's hosting it. And wow. we even did it through most of the pandemic outside. Wow. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. Okay. And we do a very similar thing. Um, with students who move into the houses on either end, we, we go over and welcome them, just like we welcome the family that uh, moved in two years ago and by bringing uh, some food and just checking in, asking what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've established some really long-term relationships with students who no longer live in Amherst, but we still communicate simply because of the neighborhood things we did together. And John Thompson actually started a tradition which we've done, you know, even anyway, we do what some most of the time John comes, but even when he doesn't, and I really have to thank you for this, the Cosby Avenue, and it's made a huge difference. I mean, we meet with the students in, you know, like outside, you know, just like on the sidewalk every year. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. So it sounds like we don't have changes to this section. Uh, yeah, let's not waste time with our stories, I guess. Yes. But let's good move stories. on to the <laughs> occupancy. Um, and let and me... Where, um, Pam's changes. Yeah, let, let me... I, I can pull hers up. I just... I think she copied the whole set of this section into her document. Um, you the survey didn't ask for it. and I did change I think some things but yeah I'm okay with removing I think the main point over here is still intact so so she removed the negative consequences for tenants the negative consequences for neighbors of rental properties mm -hmm. and then would have it read after the first paragraph looks, looks like she didn't change the four unrelated occupant limit appears to be poorly enforced and can be used to suppress tenants from reporting health or safety concerns. Its lack of enforcement is impacting neighbors. Apparently some landlords get around it by showing only four people on the lease and some landlords are exploiting the vulnerabilities of tenants to avoid their responsibilities of providing safe and healthy housing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's all she would leave. Right. Really? Let's see, even though the survey Because all of all of this is crossed out. Yeah, so we can remove all of that. And then that I don't is know if I want to remove all that. I think there are real negative consequences for tenants and neighbors. That and and I'm still questioning. I'm I'm still questioning if a house has. I go back to something Rob said that there's a house where it can hold up to six people. Uh, you know that and why can't there be six people there uh or if there you know my son and his wife before they were married and 
they would rent a three bedroom with their two roommates and they shared one bedroom. Uh, what if two couples were there or something? I, I don't know. You I could just have, have two couples. Yeah, see, I couldn't, so I couldn't vote for something that said we wanted to do away with the four unrelated. I'm not saying do away with it, but I think that I still want to think about, is there some way to adjust or, or to say if a house like has a five bedrooms, you can have five students. If it, you know, I, I, I don't know. But I don't think that came out of this report. I mean, I think that's no, another didn't. conversation. Yep. So that's my <laughs> in concern. The, in the report, at least from the people that, you know, again, disclaimer, this is not systematic sampling or any of that, but right. in terms of qualitative data, we cannot ignore what we did here. Uh, from tenants, uh, from neighbors, definitely we've heard about the, they feel it's not being enforced and that's causing but, all of yeah. those issues. But then also from the tenant side, there were concerns that I did not know about that came through uh, in terms of how they feel. And again, we, right. listening to people doesn't mean we have to agree and uh, you know do everything they're saying, but we do need to hear that reflect it in the report and then decide. And I think that's a conversation, at least that was my key takeaway is that we do need to have a conversation about, about that issue, but not here right. in the report. Right. The negative so consequence for think, tenants. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jennifer. No, I still think it was, yeah, there were a few tenants. I mean, if I was a student, I'd say, why can't I live with 10 of my friends? I mean, why, of course. <laughs> But I think no, that's not necessarily I, true. Not I, did, I read to. very few where the tenant said that the major issue, I mean, very few where they said they wanted to be able to live with more people. And if they did when and, and the few times when they said it, it was always couched in terms of lowering the rent, which doesn't happen. And there were many more that said I mean, there were, I think there were probably maybe more that a few said they want to lower it to three, but we're not putting that in. You know, I think just to say that there's an issue with the occupancy not being enforced, that seemed to be, but I would not say a major takeaway from this is that people wanted to be able to have more than four students living together. There were a, maybe five that said it, five students, I think I counted five. No, there were more than that. But- um, Andy J has a point. And no, Jennifer can finish, but then I'd like to. Have yeah, a no, we, you know, I can't see anybody's hand. I don't know. People will have to raise. I'm the host, so I'm not oh. sure I can. Given and, yeah. and yeah, I don't well, raise our hand because I don't know who else's hand is up. Yeah. But I thought um, I would not feel, frankly, that this was an accurate portray. I think it's getting to what some of us would like to see raised, but I don't think it was a major takeaway by in any way. And I think you spoke to Kathy Shalini, you know, that I've included all her points, though. And yeah. she was this is a lot of the changes in this are based on her. So she is. Her main thing was only ta calling it something else. It was an occupancy, but she was OK with these changes. Again, I think the important thing is. Is because this is not systematic sampling. We're not comparing, okay, 70% of the residents said this versus 30 because it's not, but it is qualitative data that if there are people, and it's not just about lowering the rent, it seemed like they were not able to complain. There were a lot of suppression and those kind of abuses that are happening. Right, so that's so, being left in in that second to last paragraph. Right. So, but we have to acknowledge that even the more number of rooms there are, I know, Jennifer, you are saying that it will not bring it down, but that's the demand and supply. If you have more supply of rooms, it is going to over time, not like tomorrow, if I increase it, but over time, as we open up more housing, more rooms, it is going to bring down the cost eventually. Yeah, you eventually won't have people, I mean, think about it. If you could put... You could, you know, even next door to any, you know, to, no matter where you live, if you could put two students in a bedroom, two in a den, a few in a finished basement, that makes every house really um, appealing to an investor. I no, mean, no, no, but it has to be safe right. and there no, has to be No, it would be safe. Different. You could have two students May in a four bedroom I, house. Yeah, Mandy, you I, know, I mean, anyway, I just we're, don't we're think this is- Mandy's turn. Yeah. 
that we're not going to get into the, the purpose of this is not to discuss right. whether we want to keep it or not, or the pros and cons. We're trying to summarize what was said yeah. by the people who responded this. Right. And I think we need yeah. to keep that in mind as we look at this. And so I'm, I'm looking at it and I think the last paragraph that Pam proposes eliminating is fine to eliminate. I don't have a problem with that. Um, Cause that's sort of, you know, that's if we're looking at this executive summary and we've talked about factors and then considerations, hmm. that last paragraph kind of gets beyond that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I think eliminating that one is fine. Um, and, and most of the rest, I, I would be fine with all of Pam's changes actually, although I question the need to eliminate the two paragraphs, these, these two paragraphs, because mm -hmm. most of the other factors, most of the other sections that summarize stuff actually do pull from the surveys. And so eliminating those two paragraphs seems like we're not pulling from the surveys for this one. Um, but I don't have a problem with eliminating those paragraphs to make it as short as it would become if we go with what Pam has suggested. Pat. I would like to keep negative consequences for tenants and negative consequences for neighbors of rental properties in. I have a problem with the beginning of the next period, the four unrelated, well, never mind. Uh, that's fine. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's um, trying to tone the report in a specific way. And I would like both those paragraphs to be there. They were comments that were made. Um, they were made through the survey. They've been made by students I've had conversations with. Um, and I... So I, I have a question for Shalini since she spent a lot more time reading everything as it is. This, this mm -hmm. paragraph here this sentence, was anything about showing only four people on the lease mentioned anywhere in the comments, do you know, or was that sort of a conclusion or was that part brought up by either neighbors or tenants? One second, let me just read, apparently someone did around by showing only four people. And how many brought it up? Yeah, no, this was definitely brought up. I didn't make this up because I didn't even know about this. So I, this is not a conclusion I drew, but this was, okay. This was one of the concerns that came through, which were not related to just the rent, but it was definitely brought up by several people. And I think if the problem exists, if it exists in four people's homes and we didn't get a full sample, the, pro the fact is that it, it exists. We can't say, oh, it's just you four dealing with it. So we're not gonna, you know, talk about it. Or I think it needs to be acknowledged. And I have heard about this outside of the survey as well, after the fact, because I went around asking like, is that something that happens? And I did hear that that does happen. So, so Shalini is okay with the changes. Would you like to keep the negative the, neg the two negative consequence paragraphs or eliminate them? Which is, which is your preference, Shalini? I mean, I think it does pull out the pros and cons and we, again, that's what we're supposed to do is listen to all and then it's up to us what we want to do with it i agree that the last statement is over board and you should that okay is in like you know the recommendation or whatever that should definitely be removed but i think leaving the negative consequences to me obviously makes sense to have it there jennifer um, what are your thoughts on these? I'm just going to pull up this one so i can start making some changes yeah and i'm actually oh i'm looking at what was in the packet yeah. So if we keep the two paragraphs, negative consequences for both tenants and the one I, I maybe we can rephrase it. It says some of the discrep tenants, disc oh, I'm sorry. It's the second paragraph in negative consequences for tenants. Some of the tenants described as being discriminatory against students who want to live with their friends and partners. I mean, they can live with their friends and partners. I mean, no matter what the limit is, they won't be able to live with all of them. So is there a way to phrase it? Because it's, like, it's not discriminating against, it's just the word discriminating is what. But I think what Shalini is summarizing is the tenants felt they were being discriminated against. So rephrasing it would be rephrasing what they wrote. Whether Did they, they actually write that? Not. 
I mean, so that's what yeah. I want to say. Is that a quote from a, it from a survey? I can, yeah, I can pull that up. I, I know I re actually remember reading that where someone said, I can't live with my friends, but they can live with their friends. In the sense, like if you own a house, you can have as many people, but if they're partners, then like you want to bring down the cost by like, let's say a partner staying, but that one partner will count towards the four limit. And so it's not really bringing down the cost. Like the so can you take out friends and put partners? Because maybe that's a different. So they it, can't be their friends, but they're saying that their partner, I don't know. I mean. Right. Partner would without, make more sense. Like, yeah, I, that's true. Partner would make more sense in that way. Because I guess what I'm saying, no matter what limit we put, if it's six, if it's eight, they still can't live with. They, they still may have friends they can't live with. Right. So right. I think if the if the surveys used friends and partners or some said friends some said partners it would be wrong to remove one of them whether or not we agree with the sentiment in the survey um we have to remember this is summarizing what was said by people who submitted the survey whether we agree with what was submitted or not um Yes, although there were people that said we should limit, they'd like to see three. So, I mean, we can't, I guess what I'm saying was we're not putting everything that was in all the surveys. Obviously, we couldn't do that. So I think I've made all the changes except for the possibility of eliminating these two paragraphs. Pam wants them eliminated. Jennifer? Um. I mean, I'd prefer they're eliminated, but I'm trying to, you know. Yeah, um, no, I get it. I'm trying to. Uh, I, I still think that one sentence, because it, I don't describe it as being discriminatory. Mm -hmm. um, I still think by writing it, it's the implication that they were agreeing that they can't live with their friends and partners, and that. I, I know it's that's just not accurate. It's not. They're saying they're discriminated against. That's their because they feeling. want to live and with their friends and partners. Right. So, but they're saying that's what they feel, and why isn't that okay to list whether you agree with it or not? I'm not. I am honestly not trying to expand the four-person limit. Right, I know. But I, just, I am yeah. trying to say there are situations where that would be acceptable and we should be able to make some of those discriminations. But that's not, that's my opinion and I don't need to put it in this. Right, and I'm just making the point that there were plenty of other kinds of statements made. Well, so that we what, didn't, you know, we didn't put in because we can't put everything in. Right. I mean, we do make the point that we we do. I mean, we do make the point from the resident side that uh, they want to limit it because it's crowding up. So I think there's a lot of information saying that yeah, there's traffic on the roads, that, or you know, parking. There's nuisance. There's noise. I think there's. It, we're not walking away from the report thinking that like, oh, this is all good. Let's change it. I think it's saying that we have a problem here, on both sides, all sides. Um, I'm thinking if there's another term instead of just. Well, I was wondering if there's a possibility to add live with like something like more of their friends and partners than allowed under the limit or, or you know, yeah, that would even be or something like right. that that might sure. satisfy Jennifer's concerns. Um, it would. The word discriminatory seems inflammatory, and that's not the intent. It is. We discriminate against students all the time in this town. Doesn't mean well, we discriminate against an awful lot of people of different types in this town. Okay. And to, to not to try to soften that word because you don't like it doesn't seem. I right. don't think. No, I don't think we're discriminating against them by saying there's a four limit. I don't. I mean, that's what you know, your opinion, yeah. I, it doesn't, but I think discriminatory is said. an opinionated word. 
So mm -hmm. it, I, I will agree it is, but that's their opinion and they have a right to their opinion. I will also say that in this committee and in other committees, um, it has flat out been stated that we can discriminate against students by some some members and some people in town have no, said I they're not they a protected so. class, so right. it, they can be discriminated against. Um, well, so, for more than know, just that issue. For Yeah, for many issues. Um, and so... Well, then could we put it in that for neighbors that there was it stated because there were several neighbors that said they thought three should be the limit. I was trying to figure out where that could go in this paragraph. Um, uh, and diminishing because of the change. It could be part of this list it, neighborhood. Yeah, there, you know, and mentioned, yeah. yeah. Of setting the limit, redo, yeah. Sure. neighbors so if we said there could only be six students in the house would that be discriminatory or eight? Oh, jennifer for no, no, not just what that. saying that <laughs> we're not getting into the substance of it we're trying to get through this engagement report yeah. <laughs> yes trust me we're still so going to go out together and have coffee sometimes i do not think it's discriminatory so when we get through the rental bylaw mm. and the nuisance by nuisance bylaw one of the things I will be putting on our agenda is further discussion of that rule because it has for the last year come up many times and I think we need to have a concentrated mm -hmm. and focused discussion on it, but it will be it is something on my list of things for us to discuss we have to get through our referrals first though. <laughs> yeah. I, I think so. I think there's there are definitely different points of view in res and within residents and within tenants. But I think at least we try to get the report in a place where it's trying to show this and create a community of empathy where we can really listen and then try to come up with a solution that works. Yeah. I know this one is hard to read because there's been a lot of changes, but is this can I ask if I feel like I don't know if John and Rob need to be right here right. for the <laughs> editing piece. <laughs> and, I'm hoping we're done soon. Okay, <laughs> that just feels <laughs> awful. <laughs> we're just trying to get through the rest of this, and then we're going to be done. So I think we're we've we've reached a compromise here. Is that correct? Is there anything on the screen? Yeah. Yep. I'm not seeing anything. Oh my goodness, really? Yeah, I'm not seeing, my screen is black. I mean, oh, I see no. the... Okay, now, do you see us? No, I see the outlines, I see your names, but I'm not seeing you. Should I try and get back on? I that would. So yeah, yeah, probably. I would, and we'll vote while you're gone. No, I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You have a quorum, you could. <laughs> But we wouldn't do that. We would not do that to you, Jennifer. <laughs> okay, so are, are you going to try and log off and log back on, or is, did your screen just, she is going to. Okay. <laughs> We're going to figure this out. I think these last three, when Jennifer I gets think back. Controversial you, that. Me? you guys were totally, the screen has been blank for the last 10 minutes for me. Oh. Here. Are we back? Yes. Excellent. Good. And Jennifer is back. So we're okay, moving so on to seven. Factors concerning social and racial equity. Are there any requested changes? Yeah, we just didn't get enough number of, which we is just to say that we need to do a better job next time. Yeah. To keep trying harder. It was a survey design. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, was the survey put out in other languages? I forget. Thing? I can't even remember, it's so long ago. We didn't draft it in other languages, but what I don't know is whether Engage Amherst has the ability to translate it. That, yeah, yeah that, that's what I don't know. There's a lot of information then that we really don't have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was, it was totally on us. That part yeah. was totally on us. Yeah, and, I, and I didn't- Other yeah. key findings, any requested changes? Wait, who added that one? Oh, reworded several. Can you, yeah. 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 I, something has to be here because it's a weird sentence. 
That R is hanging. Residence, maybe? Residential. Can you move the Baum Milne thing? Because it's stopping me from reading the thing. What Baum? There was a uh, your name and a, a well, maybe comment. The first there. Oh, OK. Sorry. OK. Da, da, da. I think maybe they mean in a neighborhood or in neighborhoods. I was wondering if it was supposed to be in neighborhoods. Yeah. That... In neighborhoods. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other that changes? That R needs to go before it. Yeah, I, I did delete that. It's just hard to see. The, the Shalini? Yeah. But oh, were you going to say something? No, I thought that was it, but maybe there is this one. Not sure. And then there's the nutshell, but it, I think we did the nutshell. Yeah. Because it's fairly clean. Right. I accepted the changes. True. True. Anything that's clean means we, I had. We've been through it. And so. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Because these are the things I cleaned up. Yeah. Okay, so we've we been back through... to two because I didn't wasn't able to see that. No, not two. Yeah. The one we've been talking about so much was it four? Five. The occupancy limits. It's yeah. hard to read here. No, I can read it. So it many just, changes. Yeah, my screen. So it now says. So here. Oh, there you go. That's, That's what it looks like now. It's interesting because here's a discriminatory thing, I think. <laughs> let me see. Uh, can, uh, let me see. The issue came up in both tenant and neighbor written comments. While tenants indicated their reasons for changing the rule, neighbors spoke of overcrowding and lack of enforcement. So the neighbor, why don't we have a, 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 a some no. issue, you know, so issue I, I that right. the student that, mentioned. Okay. So you're saying Caught, you, you know, you know, whether it's, you know, high cost, lack of housing, those were things that uh, I think all of us could agree with, with students, whatever we think about other aspects. And I think that if you're going to have something there for neighbors, you want to have something for tenants as well. Right. I mean, we take out both or we leave both. And right. I think we've worked to leave both with the changes that we've gotten to. Right? Yeah. It does explain no, it. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. I'm sorry. I'm being a little it, too picky. Yeah, because it explains it below. Yes, it does. I think the yes, only thing I would have said is like in the last line is at the end, because we removed that paragraph, is like uh, this issue uh, needs further discussion or something. Like, no, we removed that, that one. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Okay. That's I can fine. I'm the way it is. Just, yeah, I'm just good. Let's just accept yeah. Okay. I think that takes us to everything. Yeah. Oh, I feel bad. Pam's not here, but that's so. Nice. So here's the question. I think it takes us to everything. We're missing one committee member. It is right now. I'm showing it in simple markup, but it's not clean. It still says all the drafts. Mm -hmm. And so do we want to vote today or do we want to push it off to next week? with a clean version to put a very clean version that accepts all the changes in which i can do tonight or tomorrow and get it back in the thing with new dates because i think it still says october <laughs> yep. you know, 2022 um, you know do that and then plan on a vote for next week that or makes sense you want to vote today Spot Jennifer. will be there too no i agree i think next week's good i just wanted to we had talked about it, um, I guess in the minutes it said a suggestion, but I thought we had voted on it that it would say somewhere that this is the final draft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to change all of yes. it. Yes, it would. It would add an adopted date below this, adopted by CRC X date. So I will put a clean draft in next week's packet. A, a change the agenda because I have to modify the agenda for it. Um, so let me make notes.
So I will put it in the packet. I will make sure I modify and adjust the agenda to put it in. And hopefully then we can get through it next week with a vote, but have the clean version in front of us. Thank you, Manager. Like plan? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Thank you all. I want to thank Salini specifically. Yes. Um for this. Um I'm just making my note here. Okay. Um for doing all of this work, Elena also did a lot of the work. Elena is not here right now, but Elena did a lot of work too. Um, so we thank both of you for that. I will make sure the agenda is modified for next week so that we can get it off our plates and then get it in a potential once. Hopefully we're gonna vote to adopt it. Hopefully we work through it so that it passes. But if it does, I'll make sure it makes it to the whole council too. And I'll probably end up putting it on our web page, um, asking Athena to put the adopted report on the web page and all um, so that it can be found and everything. So with that, we're moving on. Thank you, John. Very quick, one last thing, like, oh, yeah. um, because I want to um, send and uh, create this community engagement process. And we're going to talk about it in TSO. So there was a lot of learning in this process, like, you know, in terms of, who should do do the coding because now I realize that at least two counselors should do the coding for inter reliability and inter rater reliability and things like that. So there was a lot of learning. But if you think you know moving forward, but I think this was for me personally, this was really powerful to hear from all sides so systematically. And so, but moving forward, if you all think that the process needs to change in terms of how we collect it, like having it in different languages, you know, things like that. So I already made a note of that one, but if there are other suggestions, how to improve this process as a council, as a committees, how we can engage more people, then please send me your, uh, email me your ideas. Okay, well, can I just say one more in terms sure. of, um, not everybody who I know who is involved, say in the mobile market, who are tenants in, in some of the large, uh, complexes on East Hadley Road, et cetera, they don't go on the town website. So even though we would have it in other languages, it would be, I think, valuable if some we had somebody go out and say, hey, this is happening and here's how you access it, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Rob and John, for your patience as we work through that. We are moving on to the bylaw. Um, let me share that. Um, oh. Okay, I'll make it bigger. This is the bylaw as it stands right now. Um, yellow gets filled in once we aren't changing it anymore because it's the section references. So yeah. we'll fill that in when we're... It's easier to do it after it's all done instead of constantly changing the sections. So yellow is just that. Um, we still have an issue with student home. Um, and then I think this one is a clean, oh, this is almost a clean version. Um, this, the changes showing here in this version um, are to match the regulation changes that we made last time we were looking at the regulations. So a lot of these are that um, five year, three year to five year, things like that. Um, so, and I, I kept those tracked so people could see what changed in here because of the changes over there. Um, so that's the energy efficiency removal, the three to five. Um, and I think those are the only prior additional changes. Oh, we have one thing that we still haven't filled out a number with. Um, the number of days for something. For something, yeah. So so we'll go back there. And then I'd, I'd like anyone who wants additional changes to, to bring them up. So this is the outstanding violation. So this is under suspension. And one thing that could be suspended is uh, where the principal code official, when 
the order to remedy remedy has not been complied with repeatedly or when certain numbers of either notices of violation or orders to remedies have been issued within three years. And so we need to know how many that number should be. And I think John or Rob probably have a better idea than we do as to what might the appropriate number be. Which might be why it hasn't been filled in yet. John or Rob, do you guys have any thoughts on over a three year period at what point would suspension or revocation be logical to be considering? Um, I don't, uh, John, help me here. Uh, <laughs> I, it's hard because, you know, we're not, we're not, um, establishing the type of violation that it could be. So, you know, three situations of, um, you know, cars parked on the grass or one trash and one car on the grass versus two really serious life safety matters are very different. Um, that's why I think we've had trouble putting a number in here and, you know, tried to be less prescriptive and say, you know, when multiple notices of violations occur, you know, we have that or, discretion that may result in a suspension that of course is appealable. Um, could, John, could if you have a suggestion, add, go for it. I was, um, I don't have a number, but if, the thing that you said about serious violations with or when violations are serious, you know, it's maybe that might help us come up with a number because if they're fire code violations or something, how how many would you want in a year? I, I don't know. John, do you have any thoughts? You're muted. Now he's. John's going to try and figure this out. Can you? When yes, series? now we can. Sorry about that. How uh, about? I, I'm thinking of a property that we, we're working on on East Pleasant Street right now where the um the occupants are um continually parking on the lawn um and the neighbor across the street complains about it almost on a daily basis and we've written a bunch of tickets it hasn't seemed to um change the behavior if if anything the kids have gotten sneakier about it they they park out in the backyard now where you can't see it from the road but um you know so maybe that's a candidate for removing the rental permit but it's these kids aren't going to be affected by that rental permit suspension because it's not going to take effect until they're gone. We, you know, we're not going to evict them. It would certainly get the landlord's attention. I think Rob's right. If, if it's life safety stuff, I mean, that's pretty serious, but I, I'm trying to think of a property, Rob, where we've, we've had life safety issues, you know, multiple times. Um, the, the response is fairly, you know, intense on time number one. Um, mm. I don't know what that number should be. I'm going to look up what our current bylaw says. Maybe it could just say, um, may revoke or suspend a residential rental permit when an order to re uh, has repeatedly not been complied with and not have a number.
so the current bylaw says in instances of egregious violations and when all reasonable and practical efforts have been made by the code official to gain compliance at a property without result, the code official may suspend a rental permit based on the specific criteria provided in section 13 of the bylaw. The permit holder shall have an opportunity to appeal. <clears throat> so section 13 talks about suspension. Um, there's an immediate suspension and then um, the specific criteria are um, knowing owner knowingly allowing or assisting in allowing violations of the bylaw, um, owner or agent repeatedly refusing or neglecting to comply with an order of the code official. Um, the code official must find that the owner or agent have not taken action to achieve compliance and that at least 90 days have expired without compliance since the date of receipt of the enforcement order. So some of the language is egregious violations. So it could be when more than X notice of violation or orders to remedy for egregious, I, you know, it could be something like that. Can I just yeah. ask? Sure, Shalini. I thought that language seemed fine to me, unless John and Rob feel that that's broken. There's something broken about it that it's not clear enough, or it doesn't give you enough guidance what to do. Is there something we need to improve upon? You know, is that is it confusing for you all when to do what, or like what are we trying to fix here? Because that language seemed fine to me. So the suspension in the current bylaw has to, the principal code official has to comp collect compelling documentation through investigation to substantiate the violations and support the recommendations to suspend a permit. Yeah, that's not a problem. We do that now. Yeah. What, what I like about the current language is that it's still at our discretion. Um, you know, it's it's hard to make a black and white rule about when you're going to do this to someone. So our current language doesn't allow for action to be taken when there's repeat offenses. And that's something we specifically had asked for in this new version. And, and this does that, um, you know, the failure to act within 90 days is is different than having repeat offenses. Um, so I think, again, if we have, I mean, I, I prefer not to have a number, but if it has to have a number, I'd keep it low, like one a year, so three. And then that gives us, you know, it's a may revoke. And that would, that would leave it up to the discretion of the code official, depending on the severity of the, the violations to take that action. I guess the next question is, do you want repeated over three years or do you want it over one or two? Like, is this too long of a time? It, I think it works because, um, so John, you mentioned a little while ago that you're, you were having trouble thinking of cases where there's repeat code violations, serious code violations, but um, you know, I know the first several years of the program, that's what we dealt with on Phillips Street in the same properties, and it's year to year. And the frustration that we had back then was that, you know, we were just in the, you know, it's a different set of tenants, it's a different, but in these are landlord issues, not necessarily tenant issues. And we wanted to be able to do something in those situations where we came into the same property found the same problems a year, six months, nine months, whatever it is later, a, a new new group of tenants in there. Uh, so I, I think that three years is okay. Okay. Okay, so that one is fixed. We now don't have a an empty line there. 
any other requests for changes from um, people? I know I have a couple that I read. I think most of mine are kind of scrivenery. Um, D1 and F1. So F1 is just a, we were missing the word permit. Section F1, second pair, there is no second paragraph here. Issuance or second sentence probably. Um, may issue a separate permit for each dwelling unit. We were just missing the word. Um, and in D1, this one is um, down here when I was reading this over, we originally had permits had to, before a, an owner could offer to rent rent or um, operate a rental unit, they needed a permit. And we got rid of the offer to rent. Yet it, I, I think we never fixed this one because here it says um, the property owner shall submit evidence to the appropriate exemption. So this is exempting when you don't need to get a permit prior to operating, renting, or offering to rent. So I think we just need to do operating or renting to just clean up the fact that we've removed the requirement to get the permit before offering to rent, because that was kind of unworkable. Is that okay with everyone? Those were my two bylaw changes. Does anyone else have any questions on or anything they would like to review in the bylaw. There was a question of student home. Pam wanted a definition of student home added into the bylaw, um, but we don't use that word at all in the bylaw. And I don't know whether she intended to ask for something added to the bylaw related to it. And so I would delete it at this point. Pat, you're you're oh. muted. I was just saying Jennifer has her hand up. Oh. How do I not see Jennifer's hand? Oh, Jennifer. <laughs> no, I just kind of answered my own question. I thought that was coming under short term, but I see that's just another number short term. So I don't have. Yeah. Question. So for now, is everyone OK to remove it? Or can we leave it till Pam gets back? We can. I don't expect us to vote today on anything. Um, we're going to decide what our next steps are today, hopefully, but I'm not sure we're going to get to votes. Um, so we could leave it and ask, um, or we could remove it. Thoughts? Jennifer says leave it until we ask. Okay. Yeah, that okay. would be mine. Um, any other, let's see where the other comments are. Um, the three to five. I, I made all the threes five in this section. And that was exempt. We've removed the energy efficiency, so we're not referencing it in the bylaw because we removed it all from the regulations. Um, we had a question about this written notice we're requiring on transfers of property but that's not really related to the bylaw. It's more of when it's in the bylaw, what is, what's gonna be done. Um, okay, here's one. This paragraph here, we weren't sure whether it should be here or um, in the regulations. This is the information sheet. So I think the question was, do we just say that owner shall distribute to each tenant an information sheet provided by the town, you know, provided by the town that includes whatever as defined by regulations or an information sheet as defined by regulations and then move the paragraph to regulations or do we keep the definite, essentially the description of the information sheet in the bylaw? I think it can be moved to uh regulations and just note it in the way that you stated. Mm -hmm. 
Give me a second. Mandy Jo, question about that. Do we are we consistently doing that? That we we're, have yeah. We have tried to put as much of the sort of descriptive stuff of like what goes into the application into the regulations. Mm -hmm. You know, how what what is what is included in the inspection, what is what questions are asked for the application. Um, we've tried to put as much of that into the regulations as possible. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was the question here. Do we sort of mirror that with this one? Yeah, I think as long as people know what to expect. I mean, I personally would prefer not looking at multiple documents, but if the regulation, I would have to look at regulations, it makes sense then to streamline this and put everything in one document, I suppose, and be consistent about it. Okay, um, so distribute an in tenant information sheet. The signed copy, I think we want to keep in the bylaw. I think that's, yeah, that should be in there. And then for the short term rentals, we're just describing where it needs to be. So I think that fixes that one. Legality goes to KP Law. And that's these three. What's this one? Rob or John, do we know what language we could use to somehow list the notices of violations that were issued to properties on the website somehow? Right here it says open gov placement. Yeah, so these used to go um, into the records that um, we maintained in the GIS system, but um, I mean, they're stored in OpenGov now. And if you, I, I'm not sure about the public side, if you pull up a property, if you could see those, um, I can see them and, you know, everyone in the office can see them. I'm not sure what you can see on the public side. Question from Mike Warner, maybe, Rob? Yeah, we haven't built that system out entirely, but I, I think the intent is to have it be publicly displayed similar to how it was with GIS, but we haven't, we haven't done that yet. Um, but it certainly isn't something that would, you know, that language has to change what you have highlighted now. Yeah. Is there a way we can make it general, something like publicly available? Available for public access and viewing and not be specific where. I mean, it yeah. certainly is it certainly is in our office uh, as one option, but we're, you know, our intent is to get it into the the public side of the permitting program and licensing program.
and available for public. Do once compliance is made, or should it just be public access and viewing for five years or something? Yeah, I would just end it there because yeah, we don't. It, it never goes away. Oh, okay. <laughs> So that, everyone good with that? So this one, we need to know what we're doing with nuisance bylaw. So I think we're not changing it now, unless I guess the question is, What is this committee's and, and Robin John's thoughts on tying violations of the nuisance house bylaw or frankly a noise bylaw or other types of bylaws to the ability to get a residential rental permit on the property? because that's sort of what this one is doing. Is it something we want to tie or not? So Mandy, do you mean a renewal of a permit because of the noise violations is that is that what you're getting at here because well, how, how would you how would you keep somebody from getting a rental permit they, they they'd already have one wouldn't they so this one would allow this language would allow if um the way the the draft of the nuisance property bylaw redraft of the rewrite of it is drafted right now essentially upon the third violation of the bylaw you get designated a nuisance property. There's a first one, then there's a second one that's a problem property, and then there's a third one that's a nuisance property. Um, so upon that sort of third violation within a certain amount of time to get you designated a nuisance property, once that happens, this language says, and it's mirrored in that draft too. So it's it's fully noticed in that one too. You know, it doesn't just pop up here. It says it in that one um, that says that the you guys could revoke or suspend the permit. Um, I'd have to go back to the issuance. I think it might be up there too. Um, a permit will be denied. Yeah. Um, so so both you could upon it becoming a nuisance property if it has one you could suspend or revoke it um and if it is a nuisance property you would be able to deny um the issuance of a permit come permit renewal or application time so so those two so so that's how it's this bylaw is currently written and it only it's written for that only for this nuisance bylaw draft that we've just started working on. So part of the question is, we've just started working on it. Do we keep it in here if these are not going to go parallel? But you know, the bigger question is, um, is that something we want tied? Do we want other bylaw violations, general bylaw violations to affect whether the property can obtain or keep a rental permit? And I don't think we've totally discussed that. So thoughts. Hey, Melanie? Yeah, I, it, to me, it makes sense to tie it given that, um, you know, we heard from so many residents uh, of the issue they have and i think we're addressing the cause it's not the students but it's when it is happening it could be a student it could be a non-student but when there is nuisance and it's not being dealt with that's what's creating this perception or whatever so i think it tying it to this gives um 
gives us more control or some something that can be done to control that. I don't know. I'm just rambling, but I feel yes, it should be. Jennifer. Yeah, I don't want to get us off track, but I just, just had a question. I think John will understand where I'm coming from. Um, you know, some of the houses that seem to be the greatest nuisance, it doesn't have anything to do with the occupants, but it's the way the landlords may keep the house. So if there's a house and that maybe it's just a different part of the body that is, you know, constantly not in good repair, that's, I guess, not a nuisance, but if it's, I guess, is it ever not a code violation? Like I'm thinking of 20 Allen Street again, <laughs> has new owners, it still looks terrible. There's always garbage, it's not in good shape, but it may be up to code. Can that still in some way be a problem property or a nuisance property? John um, or Rob? Yeah, well, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. I looked at those pictures that you took and yeah, it looks like the porch could use a coat of paint. I don't have code about that, though, that I can enforce. Right. It's not a code violation. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah and but so that begs the question, you know, I don't know whether we'd have to go back to the nuisance bylaw and, and we're in the middle of discussing what constitutes a nuisance, but upkeep. I, I think the current draft has some upkeep as nuisance, mainly related to shrubs and stuff, um, not necessarily related to the painting of a house or the painting of a porch. Um, some upkeep, you know, if we remove the renter side, say, some owners don't have money to right, upkeep exactly. their house. And so if they don't have the, you know, and, and I'll give an example, we're, we're, we've been quoting out painting of our house to get it repainted this year. And, and it's close to five figures, you know, it's just quite expensive to paint a house. Um, and so not everyone can do that every five or six years, they might only be able to do it 10 or 11, right? And right. So can't get all the way up and all. And so does that become is that something we should be citing people for? And I'm not sure it's something we should be citing people for. No, we shouldn't. Um, and so, yes, it might look like a nuisance in the neighborhood, but it shouldn't be, you know, this, uh, I, I don't want to say criminalized because not all our bios are criminal violations, but civil violations and all. And so what then, for what reason should we be suspending or not issuing a rental permit, I guess is what I go back to. And um, I think about it more as going back to my reasons for wanting to revisit the rental permit and, and do this. And it's more on ensuring that, that everyone is living in a safe and a safe residence. Um, and so that, that goes back to the code violations, which are covered in number one and two, but it doesn't really go back to tenant behavior. Um, although I do agree that a lot of times, sometimes tenant behavior can be reflective of landlord negligence <laughs> the management whatever the word is i'm looking for right um and so where's the appropriate place to deal with that and i'm not sure the issuance or not of a permit to rent is the appropriate place so i go back to this one and i say i'm not sure i'm comfortable with this being a reason to suspend or revoke a permit or not issue one but I, I, I'm, I'm still torn. <laughs> Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, that, again, probably another conversation, but, you know, a real issue for people with, you know, in neighborhoods where there's a lot of, um, particularly, well, probably all, maybe, I'm not saying it's just with students, but that's what I see here, and it has nothing to do with the occupants, and I agree, you can't require people to paint their house, or, you know, of course you can't do that, it's for a whole host of reasons, 
But I think what really gets to people way more than anybody having anything to do with anyone who lives in it is seeing some big land own, you know, so this 20 Allen Street was the house that was condemned. It has new owners. I didn't know until a couple of weeks ago who owned it. And it's a major property owner in town. You know, so we have who could well afford for it, the house not to look that way, first for the sake of the tenants living there. So I don't know how we deal with that, but I'm just saying that is a, I, I know you think some of, you know, people may have issues. It's, I think less who's the students. I mean, although sometimes, you know, if you have more than a certain number of things, there's, you know, issues with that, but it's the way some of these landlords who are taking a lot of money out of the property and they're really putting nothing into maintaining it. So this may not be where, but if we could solve that issue, it, it would solve a lot of concerns in town. Just, yeah. Anyway. Shalini. Yeah, I think this, this probably needs to first be discussed under nuisance and then we can come to this because we haven't yet decided also you know, who's bearing the, who's responsible? Is it always the landlord or is it sometimes the students or tenants rather? And sometimes, um, look at me, I just missed tenants and students made them synonymous. My bad, I apologize. Um, but um, I think, yeah, this needs a further discussion before we can decide about this. So, in you know one of our goals as a committee is to get this out of our committee and back to the council um and so what about a proposal where we you know uh, so i'm looking at ways to finalize things so that we can get to a vote and and be done with it in this committee and so i think if it needs further discussion and we're we're nowhere near finishing up nuisance by law <laughs> you know that that's months probably um, I think my recommendation or my thinking would be to delete number three, make a note, at least for notation purposes for now, put it into a final report on this that says, hey, we might want to, when nuisance bylaw is finished, come back and potentially look at modifying this bylaw or adding it in depending on where it is in that process to think about and reconsider whether or not that should be part of issuing, suspending, or revoking permits violations of that bylaw. So sort of put it off, but not wait for this, not hold this bylaw until all of that is decided. What are people's thoughts on that? Deleting it from here and from the denial up there, but making sure it's part of the report out of this stuff that says, these are things that we might want to revisit in another year or two to this bylaw. I see a nod from Shalini. Shalini. I agree with that, but I'm also just curious um, what John and Rob think about, would this help you in with respect to the nuisance or would it be unfair to landlords or like what is your take so cur currently we don't enforce the nuisance bylaw that's handled by the police department and i guess my concern for bringing them together in this way is how far the draft nuisance regulation has expanded or you know may expand uh, you know i'm looking at it now for things like sidewalk construction you know overgrown grass and weeds and things like that um fire alarm firearm uh false alarms uh junk vehicles uh and i just didn't think there was the need to tie them together uh with our new rental bylaw being so much stronger uh it kind of will work well on its own and and then this bylaw could also work well on its own. So I didn't see the need for the connection at the moment, but I think it does make sense to finish that one up and then make that decision. Okay, so I've made the notes. That note would obviously be deleted. And John's but, hand is up. Oh, John. Yeah, I, Rob makes a lot of sense there. My 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 gut reaction to to tying these together is a lot of these nuisance um, 
disturbances or behavior things. And it's that's on the tenants usually or the occupants or even, you know, people wandering by. Um, the police have pretty wide discretion about what they cite and what they don't. But, you know, a noise violation is to lose your rental permit. That's that's hard on a landlord. And I don't know what, what control they have over a thing like that. I mean, something like uh, townhouse apartments, you know, where you got 3,000 people out of control, whose who's rental permit are you going to take away there? Thank you, John. Pat. Yeah, after listening to Rob and John, I feel like we should unhook them. Um, the nuisance bylaw is a separate bylaw and it doesn't need to be integrated in this spot. Or anywhere actually in the rental registration. And I think I've hit the two space spots that it was now. Um, next up is this green one. I think it's just, this is the principal code official shall schedule the hearing um, on um, the order to vacate. Um, is that the appropriate person to schedule the hearing, I guess, is the question. Rob, are you the one that sort of does those? Um, Or is it, should it be someone else? I think that's fine because it would be, or designee, I guess, you know, by definition. So I think that's all right. We'll just put it in just to be clear. Pat, you're muted, Pat. Sorry, I have a very minor thing. It's. Um, I can't find it now where it says, oh, yeah, uh, the, here, um, the purpose of the hearing will be to review the vacation order. Um, well, I think it should say order to vacate. You don't like? <laughs> I thought it was weird, too. And I was like, oh, that works. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think suspension and revocation procedures. Um, notice effective date and then there's an appeal um we have kp law stuff and i think i added that regulations governing appeals may be adopted just to be clear that they can do that um and then I've, it's added to the regulations and i think that takes us through this draft bylaw anything else That moves us on. I'm actually going to do the regulations over the fee structure given the time. Because um, I think. Actually, no, because um, I, I know why I put that last. Um, the the Board of License Commissioners is still discussing their the the regulations and and the review of that, they're actually discussing it right now, um, which I haven't been able to make their meetings because I'm at these meetings. Um, and so I think I was waiting for us to do the final review until we heard from them, particularly with the new language on appeals. I, I thought it would be, you know, sort of duplicative if we reviewed it before they did and then after they did. So um, I'm waiting to hear back from them on regulation. So before I go to fee structure, what are our next steps on bylaws? The bylaws are basically done. The regulations have very little left to do on them. Do, do we want to next vote to recommend, you know, do we want to vote to send these back to the council next, or do we want to send these off to KP? See if we could, if we send, if we could send them off to KP law for a review now. Um, and then if if we and then whenever we want to vote to send back to the council, is our vote, what are people's thoughts on whether the vote would be a recommendation to adopt or a recommendation to send off to TSO for review and recommendation? Because I think if everyone remembers, I think 
the council assigned it to us to work on, but thought that maybe TSO was the technically correct committee to be making a recommendation. I don't know. Um, and so I think we need to be thinking about what our vote language would be in terms of what are we voting to recommend or send to the council and, and is it a recommendation to adopt um, or recommendation to send to GOL um, for final review? And when do we do we want to see if we can get a KP law review now or wait or have GOL do that or TSO do that or whatever the council decides? Um, Pat and then Shalini. I think we should get it sent off to KP law as soon as we can, because it, when it comes back, we'll have some work to do. I'd hate to see it go to one or two other committees and then go through KP law and then come back because would we then have to refer it back to those committees? Um, so I think that's the most efficient thing to do. Shalini. I just had a question about, you had said that somebody or someone had said that there was a group of people who were in the original neighborhood association, something, something who wanted to meet with us again. And are we not doing that? Jennifer. Um, so what that was is there were actually a, um, a couple of landlords who were concerned about the inspection process mm -hmm. and they wanted to talk with us about it. So it was, how would we handle that? If, you know, would we, yeah. so, so that's, that, that's, it's not really that mysterious. Like one of them happened to be on the initial, um, you know, healthy, safe and healthy neighborhoods task force, but that was not really relevant to it. Um, so I think there's, you know, some of the big landlords were, cons you know, who own, were concerned about how many, inspections did I mean they probably talked to you some people have spoken to you Rob so it was like you know they were interested in speaking with the CRC so you know but yeah, so we, all Pam and I could say is we'd we would refer it back to all of you I don't hey, Rob were you going to say something or? Um, uh, I can just add that I have talked to most of the, the owners that you're talking about, um, met with some of them, you know, over time and, um, you know, remind them that this is a good opportunity to, to bring their opinions and, and comments to this group that meets regularly. They're not here. Um, you know, I'm aware of their concerns, um, but, you know, I don't, I, there was nothing that I needed. I felt I needed to recommend to this committee, um, you know, for changes. I think we did address one of the concerns that, that I know that they had related to the, uh, the need to collect the energy information. Uh, I know that was a concern of theirs, but, um, you know, establishments or uh, complexes that are subject to other inspections for other programs. Uh, you know, we have ways of dealing with that in the bylaw now, and I just not sure that it was up what all understood at the time that I met with some of them and went through the bylaw, the draft bylaw. That wasn't much different than the version we have now. Uh, but I, I continue to remind them that th this is a good place to come have those conversations. Thank you. Shalini, then Jennifer. And I think I'm just also thinking back to the time when they did come and talk to us uh, in the listening session that we had. And I don't know if we as a as CRC ever debriefed about that because there were a lot of questions raised there. If this is adding to the bureaucracy, how this might harm uh, smaller landlords and will only be left with the big landlords who can afford all of this. And so, I, they did come to us and I don't feel, I, at least I don't remember us doing a debrief of or how we are factoring in or how did we respond to those, some of those concerns and questions. Jennifer. Yeah, no, and these were the, you know, like Rob said, large landlords. And I think there's, but, you know, I think there's a feeling, well, you know, focus on inspecting the problem properties, but, mm -hmm. 
you know, like you said, you don't necessarily know until you inspect. So I don't know what that the happy medium is. Um, that you know, I think there's just a feeling of if the sense that they've been, you know, some that they've just, you know, they run a good shop and there hasn't been a problem. But I think I don't know. So if you want to have the conversation. I'm not advocating for it. I'm just saying, I, I guess there's no way, you know, it's like, how do you put it? I have to abide by the speed limit, even if I've never had a violation. So I, maybe this, so I guess the question is, is it that we can't make everybody happy or should we, you know, have a conversation? I, I'm not necessarily advocating one way or the other, but um you know, Rob, I think there's a feeling on some of the large landlords that this is not, this is an, um, this is going to be an imposition to them. And I don't know how to handle that. I don't know if you have any feelings about it. Or it's just, it's just kind of the way things work. <laughs> Rob? Well, uh, oh, uh, can I speak? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, there's there's one of those land, landlords in particular that is, you know, is looking for some information that I'm putting together that um, tries to explain kind of what we deal with. And, um, you know, because they, I think that group of those larger property owners don't really um, have a good sense of what happens with these one and two family homes, which is, you know, the bulk of our work. Um, you know, that John deals with are on the, the single family and two family properties and smaller, smaller properties. But there are cases and, and there are examples where we are responding to the larger complexes. So, you know, I, I think our, the history doesn't suggest that they shouldn't be part of the program. Uh, and I know they're really concerned about having to carry the fee that will support the program because of their large number of units. Um, and they're, you know, taking into account the fact that they have on-site staff and all of those, you know, all those obvious things. Um, I, don't, I don't feel like they're unsupportive of what we're doing. I just think they're really, they really want to kind of be sure about the, the final details related to fees and how often we would be inspecting the properties. In fact, my conversations there, they weren't opposed to an inspection. Uh, and, you know, I think there were concerns about how often and for how long does it have to go on for. So there's, there's just questions there that I don't know if we have the answers to yet. Thank you. Felony. Yeah, I'm just looking back to the listening session and I actually have people who are smaller landlords and I'm just reading some of their comments where small property owners rely on rentals for retirement and if with the added bureaucracy and fees structures is going to push the small landlords and they'll sell to investors so I'm actually reading more from the smaller landlords who are concerned about the additional bureaucracy and fee structure. So is there maybe a way to ask people specifically, like, what do you feel is adding to the bureaucracy or because if people are just generally saying, oh, this is too much, is it be just the feeling or like you said, like they did not have the full information. So maybe they haven't understood it correctly. Or are we really adding hoops and loops where we don't need to add? So, I mean, one of the things I would say is we've done a lot of public forums. Rob's office has, through, I think Steve has, for every public forum, I believe, distributed a notice of that to all of the current owners who have permits. For at least two of them, I know that was distributed. Um, and so, and, and in those public forums, we've offered essentially for at least one of them open comment to be able to talk about some of this and 
it we can only do so much if they're not willing to come to us despite all of the outreach we've done um we can only guess right um I think we've heard some of those concerns and tried to address some of that, right? We've eliminated um, energy efficiency requirements. We've tried to address some of it. We've, at Rob's suggestion, upped the inspection to every five years in general. And, you know, so I think we've tried to address, address some of it, but it's hard to do more if we don't have people talking to us. And and I'm not sure this is a case of people not knowing. As Rob said, he's talked to people, he's encouraged them. We've sent out to the list of people who we know would be affected by this. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, and yes, maybe we could do more, but I don't think we've shirked our responsibility in letting people know this is happening. Pat. Yeah, a quick thought. I uh, had a wonderful conversation with Fred Hartwell the other day, and he told me how he how much money he makes from the, his rental property, you know, and also the expenses that he can apply to reduce his tax burden overall, both federal and state. So it does seem to me that people who are um, earning money, do, you know, through rental, whether they're small or large, isn't there a way for them to um, reduce some of their tax burden by, because this is an expense. And if you're going to rent property, there are expenses attached to it. So it, it just seems to me, we're not going to please everybody. And I think we really need to have in place some way to care for property in town, but also to care for the staff by having enough of it and, and having clear guidelines for them to use and work with. I think you do a, a tremendous job and in many ways, um, but I think land, if you're gonna make money in our system, then you have expenses attached to that and you can reduce your taxes. Thank you. Um, I think it's John. Yeah. I I think um, you're running a business, you know, there's, there's, there's rules that apply to it. Uh, and, and I, and I gotta say that these little one-off um, owners and landlords are where we spend most of our time. Thank you. Okay. So I will send the bylaw off to KP law. Well, I will send it off to Paul requesting a KP law review. Um, I will request that review for return by um, the first meeting in May, whatever that one is. <laughs> Actually, that might be two weeks from now. We might end up with three in a row, although maybe we're on May 11th. Um, I have to look. Um, but in order to do that, um, I realized we actually haven't made it through all of the regulations I don't want to do appeals today, but I would like to make it through the parts of the regulations that aren't appeals, um, just so we have made it through it all. Um, and so let's do that quickly. And then the next time we deal with this, we will do fee structure. Um, so we stopped at parking site plan. And so the question is, does anyone have any additional changes to the parking site plan requirements section um, or requests for that section. I am not seeing any hands. It does look like people are reviewing it. I'm going to page up. And then the only other one is the tenant information sheet. As I said, appeals. I I don't I think it would be more efficient if we wait until we hear from the Board of License Commissioners on their thoughts on this section before we review it. Um, so tenant information sheet, I just drafted. It's in two paragraphs. Um, 
the second paragraph basically matches what we removed from the bylaw today to move over here. Um, the first one indicates where it should be, just that it should be on the town's website um, so that owners can download it for distribution. And that could be either there or a link in the application, whatever. Um, but any additions, subtractions, or whatever to that new paragraph for the information sheet. Looks like Jennifer is still reviewing it. Oh no, not, okay. <laughs> I was looking back and forth, so I thought she was still reviewing it. Shalini. <laughs> yeah, one of the things I was thinking, like this is really important, but could there be like a cheat sheet or something for them? Because my sense is that tenants don't read, even I don't read when I was a tenant. They're like, the general things are so long, but if there's like a cheat sheet that can be provided to them about, you know, complaints or like, what are the key pieces of information that, I mean, I don't think that needs to be included here though. I but I think that's what this goal is. And this sheet, Rob, correct me if I'm wrong. It's only, is it a front back or is it just a front now? It's just a one page document. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So, yeah, because we already do this. So, <laughs> um, any other questions on that? That takes us to the appeals section, which we will review later. I know it's all new. I will leave it as new, um, but I will make everything else the same. Um, that leaves us with time. Let's see. So we have, that's the bylaw, that's the regulations. Um, I'm going to go to public comment um, at this time. We're not, and when public comment finishes, I will describe what we'll do with the other things. Um, but we'll start with public comment. Um, public comments on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC are accepted at this time. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Um, CRC will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during public comment. If, at this time, if you would like to make public comment, please raise your hand. Okay, um, we have one hand raised. Um, Renata Shepard, please unmute yourself, state your name, where you live, and make your comment. Hi, Renata Shepard, Amherst. Um, I just saw the paper on the, uh, the fee structure. And uh, apparently the lowest fee is 175, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what happened to the $100 fee structure? I guess that went away, maybe I missed that. Uh, please make the feast, uh, include inspection. Yes, businesses have expenses, but the more expenses, the higher the rent. And if the rent can't be higher, then the business go bankrupt. About the number of violations before suspension, uh, please consider who's responsible, tenant versus landlord, and who will be affected. A tenant may face eviction and not really care, but the landlord may suffer tremendous loss during eviction because it has to be done you know, with the legal counsel. Uh, fines for, for parking on the lawn or removing smoke detectors, et cetera, is a resident issue, not a landlord issue. Yes, the landlord can go and try to resolve that, but if the tenant keeps doing it, you know, what do we do? The tenant must be fined. Um, the landlord must have the opportunity not to renew a lease uh, due to their behaviors, but not lose their livelihood over it by losing their permit or trying to evict given usual leases have one year terms. So we cannot renew when the lease renews. Um, and if, if this committee is going to be even more intrusive and try to regulate what or how to paint or how to paint your rental, then, well, you must do it for the whole town. Um, how can you run a business like that? I mean, it's it, it, that in itself can cause a town not to be affordable. So if you have any wishes for affordable housing, please take those things into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Renata, for your comment. Um, with that, 
Um, we have recognized everyone who has raised their hand for public comment, so public comment is closed. Um, before we go to minutes, I, I wanted to see how long public comment would take. I am going to, we're not going to do nuisance house bylaw today, um, which has been renamed under the draft public nuisance bylaw. And I would like to take a few minutes before we get to the minutes um, and announcements and next agenda to talk about the fee structure and schedule and see what we want to do. Um, I'm not going to bring it up, but I'd like this committee's guidance. So what is in the packet is a a blank uh, is a document that's blank that lists all the fees we could do. We haven't set any fees yet. We haven't even agreed on what some of them might be, even some of the more basic ones. What is also in the packet is an Excel spreadsheet that shows some options um, for what fee structures might look like based on two of the structures we've talked about in this committee. Um, one where the inspection fee for the required inspection is separate from the annual permit fee and one where the two are together. Um, those are the two structures we've kind of talked about in this committee and, and said go forward with, with more investigation. That document has been updated for to reflect the potential number of inspections that would happen on a five-year schedule versus the three-year schedule that the prior document showed um, because we've moved to a five-year schedule. So it's updated with less inspections per year. Um, obviously, all of this is just in some sense speculative and guesswork based on how many permits are issued, how many inspections might have to happen every year and all of that. That is just an example. What I would like to know from this committee is, is it the committee's goal when we make a recommendation, whatever we make on the bylaws and regulations to also make an actual recommendation on the actual fees? Or are we aiming to make a recommendation on some of the fees, maybe things like the appeals fee and late fees and no-show fees for inspections and stuff like that, um, and then leave the rest of the fees up to another body? And I ask that because we have struggled as a committee to not just talk about the fees, but come up with actual fees. And in my thinking, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking we as CRC may not be the best committee to discuss the actual fees and how much money we should be aiming the fees to collect a year in terms of revenue. We've always operated under the assumption that this program would be revenue neutral. Um, but my thinking has sort of evolved to maybe we recommend a structure and some of the more basic fees, but when it gets into the heart of the fees, the permit fee and the inspection fee, that it might be more appropriate for the finance committee to delve into that because they could make a better recommendation based on whether the program should be revenue neutral or whether there are other considerations to include such that then they know what number we're aiming for, whereas we're operating under revenue neutral right now. We don't know, for example, we've heard requests for UMass to pay for some of this program. We don't know where the town's negotiations stand with something like that. Um, but the finance committee, I've come to think, might be the better committee to delve into those conversations. They have the right people there they do the budget, they do stuff. Um, but I would like this committee's guidance on where sort of which of, I see it as sort of two options right now. And if there's a third option or a fourth option, I'm welcome to hear it, um, where we're going, because I think that will help me structure a future conversation and what documents get presented and how the report gets written to the council and where we're going in terms of just um, agenda time. So what are, what are some thoughts given that, and I know we don't have a lot of time in this meeting, but I thought I'd present that now so that the next time fee structure comes up and we have time, I, I can have the right documents ready basically and, and all. So 
thoughts about some of the options I presented or whether people have other thoughts on potential other options regarding what to do with fees and recommendations to the council. Jennifer. I think um, referring it to the finance committee is a very good idea. I personally wouldn't have, I felt the whole time, I don't really personally have a clue how to address fees. Although I think, I do think that, you know, there has to be some distinction between owning one property and owning multiple. But I think um, if the finance committee will take it, I would be happy to send it off to them. Shalini. I think we, because we've heard uh, residents, tenants, um, landlords uh, perspective. So drawing out the broad guidelines, maybe, um, you know, we definitely heard even from tenants that when they're living with the landlords, there's a good relationship, they're taken care of. So, you know, they will, those homes definitely, or like, I don't know. So, so we, based on what we heard, we create the broader guidelines for the fee, but then send off to finance. Pat, do you have any thoughts? And of course, I'd like to, I'd like to send it off to finance. I would really like from John and Rob and, and Dave, if you have opinions about this as well. Uh, but I think the finance is probably the right place to really look at this. Yes. Okay. So add is here from Rob and John as well. Yeah. So the next time this comes up on the agenda, I will we will structure it for an aim for the broader guidelines and not numbers. Um, yeah. And and so so that's what we'll put in there. And I'll I'll present sort of some some options on those broader guidelines. And that's where our discussion will focus so that we can maybe make a recommendation. And, and that vote, we can't send it directly to finance ourselves. We would make a recommendation to the council that says, this is our recommendation on a structure. We also request that we recommend that the, fine, that the council refer the fee setting and the decisions regarding fee setting to finance to make a re recommendation on the fees. That is sort of how our motion would be worded that we'd ask the council to, that we would recommend the council refer to finance um, with the rest of our things. Um, but but that will be the discussion the next time on fees. We have to, we'll have to finish the regulations. Um, I suspect then that um, this takes us to, um, yeah, so that's been that. Um, I said we're postponing nuisance house minutes. The minutes were in the, I forgot to move them to today's packet. They were in the April 6th, April 13th, 6th, 13, 13 packet. Eight, no, 6, 6. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't try to schedule one on the 13th. The April 6th packet, they are the minutes of March 16 and March 30. There will be no minutes for April 6th because there was no meeting. I will say I did sign on with Athena. We made a statement. I asked her to put that sort of as part of the meetings. Um, there was no one in attendance when we signed on because the meeting had been noticed as canceled. What happened, as I said in the email, was that it accidentally got posted on when when it got posted on Tuesday the 4th, it actually accidentally got posted as a Monday, April 3rd meeting even though it was posted on the 4th. Who knew the, the town calendar could post meetings after meetings could have happened. Um, so that was an accident. Um, so I went on to, and we recorded the explanation that it was accidentally posted incorrectly, meaning we could not actually hold the meeting. Um, and then indicated that the hearing would be to the next, move to the next regular count CRC meeting. Um, so, are people okay with making um, motions and adopting the minutes of March 16 and March 30? I will I will send Athena an email and get them into the correct packet since I had them in the wrong packet. Um, um, or we can postpone them off to the 27th if people are not comfortable voting them today. 
If people are comfortable, I would accept a motion. So moved. So Pat is moving to adopt the March 16, 2023 and March 30, 2023 regular meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? I will second it. <laughs> so Mandy seconds. I didn't unmute. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I see you speaking. Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> it, it's fine. I just. With that, we'll start with Jennifer on the vote. <laughs> <Right>. Yes, <laughs> unmuted. Shalini. Yes. Pat. Aye. And Mandy is an aye. Those minutes are adopted as presented with a four to zero vote with Pam Rooney absent. Okay. Um, that takes us to announcements. I've kind of given them all because there really aren't any other than next week is the continued hearing. Um, the planning board did not close the hearing last night. They continued the hearing on that to May 3rd. 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 Um, and so that that's just informational purposes for everyone. Um, our hearing continues on April 27th at 435. Next agenda preview. The next agenda is posted because um, I just had Athena post them all so that the hearing was posted so people could know that it was there on the 27th. I'll go back and review that agenda. I forget what all I put on it other than the hearing. Um, I will go back and review it and, and update it and ask Athena to amend the agenda by tomorrow. Well, I'll send her the amendment by tomorrow. Um, we'll have the hearing on it. Um, we will add the engagement report for vote on it. Um, one I hear from the bylaw review, the, the Board of License Commissioners, I'll make a determination as to whether regulations can go back on, but I will be sending them off to KP law. So I doubt I'll put the regulations and the bylaw on next week's meeting. I'll probably just wait to do everything until we've heard from KP law. Um, but I will try to put structure the fee to have that conversation on the agenda and um, potentially the nuisance house bylaw. I'll look at what else is on there. I think right now what else is on there is a continued discussion of um, zoning priorities. And so that will remain on there too, um, because that kind of goes with the zoning revision discussion that's kind of happening. So I'm trying to keep those two grouped together and all the rental and nuisance stuff grouped together. I will go ahead and review the agenda to make sure we have enough items on it to last two hours though. So the um, April, the March 16th minutes, I just checked that agenda in the packet. We're on next week's, but it doesn't matter. Well, I always put the minutes on the agendas in case we don't get to them. Oh, okay. So I will remove them. <laughs> so when I post <laughs> agendas well in advance, they get like every set of minutes okay. and then they just get moved if we haven't done it um, if, or if we've done it. So I'm not surprised they were on there because I probably listed everything on there um, as it. Okay. Any other questions or any requests for agenda items for upcoming? Shalini. This is a very interesting presentation on tiny homes. And I wonder if we wanted to have a conversation about that. I like the idea. Uh, perhaps we can get uh, a video of the presentation to share with CRC. So the video is so the inside. video is online um, under the trusts meeting. It starts okay. about an hour into the meeting because um, I watched it through the video. <laughs> but it was the trust meeting of the thirteenth, I believe, right? Last Tuesday. Last, last Thursday. Last Thursday. So it was the, yes, the 13th. meeting of the 13th. Um, mm -hmm. If you haven't watched it or weren't at the meeting, it was a fascinating presentation. Um, I think, Shalini, that's a perfect topic to include as we discuss zoning priorities, mm -hmm. um, potentially. It, I think it feeds right into priorities for looking at zoning and what to encourage through zoning changes and all. Um, so, but I will note it um, in my notes for potential 
separate discussions and all too, but, but bring it up when we have those continued discussions. Dave. Oh, thanks, Mandy. Yeah, I was just going to mention I was away on vacation when that presentation happened, but um, certainly when Nate and I um, present to you at the meeting, which I don't know if we have a date yet of the joint meeting, another joint meeting, the CRC and the, the Housing Trust, we would include some reference to tiny houses, you know, I, separate from the, the video, which I've, I've been told is very informative. Um, but we would we would talk about you know the possibility uh, if there are any regarding tiny homes during that presentation. So I think Mandy, you and I, and maybe the co-chairs of of a housing trust, we're going to look at some dates in May, which is now you know seems far away, but it is right around the corner. It's right and around so, the corner. Yeah. So preferably not early May, but later in May would be preferable. So, yeah. So check your email, Dave. We want to meet with you and Nate early next week um, to finalize some of the questions and data and all of that. One of those emails asked, and maybe you can answer this now, the trust's preferred date given the survey, thank you for the reminder, because I didn't include this in my announcements, given the survey from CRC members was May 4th. The question to you and Nate was, um, is that enough time? And I'm seeing from Dave that it's probably not enough time. Um, and so the next preferred date was May, um, 18. That sounds better. Yeah. Okay. So, so CRC members, please mark your calendars for May 18. Um, I will let the trust individuals know that the fourth is too early or Dave, just respond to one of those emails so that the trust mm -hmm. chairs get that one. There's a couple of emails that went through while you were out. Um, so but you're, you're myself because our TSO meeting just started. So is that okay? Oh, it's a seven o'clock meeting, I thought. Oh, yes, you're right. Oh. <laughs> stay longer. Good I, I'm aiming to be done, Charlotte, yes, okay. but I, I thought it was seven. My meeting's timing's also in your mind. Okay, I'm still what here. What time is the trust meeting? Is it seven? So I had told the trust that I surveyed for any time between 6.30 and 9. So I think the trust normally starts at 7. So we haven't, I, so I think. That would be really good for me because there's a workshop at the Truth School I'd like to do from 4.30 to 6. So 7 would be better. So I will, we will. I mean, I'll make the meeting no matter what, but yeah. I would like to do the workshop that I registered for. Seven's fine for me. So I think that's normally when the trust starts their meetings. Yeah. So, um, so we'll aim for seven to nine-ish um, as, as the conversation. But yeah, so, so that was the other one. We'll plan for the 18th. Um, and Dave, myself, Jennifer, I think I started including you on those emails as since you were the liaison two trust members, two CRC members, Dave and Nate getting together to try and finalize, given the conversations and the questions that have been forwarded and asked to be able to structure the conversation and agree to what we want staff to provide information for and be ready to discuss. So um, we just need to get it scheduled. So, um, and I think we're aiming for early next week because we knew Dave was out. For most most of this week. it would be really good to know how many real affordable units we have in town not that yeah, oh this I, I had sent those yeah. off to Dave and Nate as well as the trust in terms of the convert the questions that we had so that will be some of the basis for the start of our conversation to organize the structure of the meeting and information Thank you. provided any other questions comments or Moving on to uh, items not anticipated by the chair 48 hours in advance. Are there any? Seeing none, I am adjourning this meeting at 6.34 p.m. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, Rob John, John, and Dave. Dave. <laughs> Thank you. The three musketeers. Bye-bye. <laughs>